Here's our title for today. This is the fourth lecture. And we're going to be talking about uh, antioxidants and lipids. I'll start with this little cartoon. We're going to be into, among other things, what is LDL and which are ADL and what's their involvement in the metabolism of, of fats. Okay, we ended up in the last lecture looking at how ATP is made and saw that the role of the oxygen that we breathe in is to ultimately accept electrons that were components of our food, food like sugars. These electrons are at a quite high energy level when they're in the original sugar. And then they travel through a series of metabolic pathways and the, that energy is lost, is used to drive the action of proteins within the cell, things like the proton pumps that ultimately drive the synthesis of ATP. Now, point here was that oxygen is a very reactive molecule. And in fact, oxygen can be a quite toxic molecule. Many of the foods that we eat have large complex molecules in them that deal, help us deal with the toxic effects of oxygen. So this just shows the various kinds of antioxidant molecules, lycopene, tocopherols. You've certainly heard of resveratrol. It's supposed to be an anti-aging agent. Uh, things in broccoli like glutathione, et cetera. So we're gonna talk about what are these molecules and what's their function. Here is the basic problem that oxygen can form this sort of structure, this is an O2 molecule, in which it has not completely filled the outer ring here with eight electrons. We talked in the first lecture about how atoms want to achieve this symmetry of having an even number full shell of electrons. So what can happen is it can pick up another electron from any other molecule, but often just from water molecules. And so you end up with this highly reactive form of oxygen that has this extra electron. It's negatively charged and it can combine with almost anything, including things like your DNA and make a change in the structure of your DNA and ultimately cause mutations. Now, all cells have to deal with this all the time because we need oxygen. And so we have enzymes that we make that inactivate these oxygen radicals like this form right here. So what happens is that we can either use the enzyme or we can use these antioxidant molecules to help uh, essentially soak up these oxygen radicals that form. They're present in very tiny quantities, but they're also highly reactive. And so We've seen that they're important because we've evolved quite an elaborate defense mechanism to deal with this. So here is vitamin E, a fairly complex molecule. And what happens is that that extra electron on these oxygen radicals can get picked up by this oxygen in the ring here. So we see this molecule picks up the oxygen radical with the extra electron and it gets initially localized in this oxygen, but the dashed line here means that it is really spread over the whole molecule, and thus it becomes less reactive because this large antioxidant molecule can kind of absorb the energy of this high energy electron and kind of spread it out to, to effectively dilute its effect, make it less reactive. Uh, so plants have thousands of antioxidants, and these are often doubling as pesticides. Why do they have this? Because they've evolved to resist being eaten by animals, by insects. They're natural insecticides. And all the food that we eat has many, many of these insecticides. They're essentially pesticides. Some of them are 
nearly the same as ones that are synthesized. Some of them are identical to things they synthesize. So they can, this is what you can find in cabbage. And if you cook the cabbage, you generate even more of them. Now, cabbage is not particularly high in these. It's just a, a good example. So you can see that it contains molecules like different kinds of cyanides, terpenes, which are very fragrant, uh, kind of the smelly kind of molecules you find in pine tar, pine pitch rather, phenols, highly reactive molecules. So what's the function of these? Well, here we have one of the basic ways that we deal with these highly reactive oxygens in our cells. One of the major enzymes is called superoxide dismutase. Dismutase meaning change the molecular form of it, change it from one form to another. And in this case, the enzyme here has a little site on it that can bind these oxygen radicals. And once bound there, it can convert them from the oxygen radical to normal oxygen, and often water is involved in that. And if, in fact, you have a mutation in this enzyme, it can lead to some severe diseases. So it tells us that this whole process is important. But it turns out to be quite complex. It's not straightforward. So oxygen radicals are bad for you. Then does that mean antioxidants are good for you? Well, it's complicated. So let me show you one experiment right here. So you can do experiments with simple animals where you can, for example, inactivate that enzyme that I showed you previously, superoxide dismutase, and find out what happens. Does the amount of this dangerous form of oxygen actually go up? And the answer is it does. So what we're showing in this graph is this is the survival of worms. How long do they live? Normally they, they live about 25 days. These are tiny little worms called C. elegans that are often used in the lab. If you mutate the superoxide dismutase, what you find is if you check in the cells, they have high levels of these oxygen radicals. But you get the surprising result that they actually live longer. And this is not completely understood. Now, do antioxidants, if you are fed them in your food, actually lower the amount of these free radicals? Well, you can measure that by you give the worms antioxidants and you find out in fact that the free radical levels go down and the life expectancy of the worm becomes the same as a normal worm. So something's very complex here that's going on that's, that's not fully understood, that the radicals are a bad thing. On the other hand, if you get rid of them, at least in this particular model, under these particular circumstances, you actually give rise to a longer living worm. All right. Now, the reason that uh, these experiments have been done is because there's a lot of interest in using antioxidants as a way to boost the health, boost your health. And you know, you, you see foods advertised in high in at antioxidants, and all the epidemiology says that that is good for you. Well, what about if you take a, just take a supplement, just take the antioxidant itself. And examples of antioxidants are beta carotene, that's the colored molecule that you see in carrots, vitamin A, vitamin E. What if you try to boost the level of antioxidants in your body by taking these vitamins? Well, a lot of clinical studies have been done on this. And in this particular paper, I'm looking at a, a really nice review article from uh, Scientific American published a few years back. And they looked at 68 different uh, clinical trials and they found that there were 47 of them that they thought were the, done with the best scientific accuracy. And they simply asked the question in the trials, did they in fact make people less likely to die? Or were the antioxidants actually in these supplements 
actually bad for you? And did they show a higher rate of mortality? So the, the way to read this graph is down here. It, they found that if you took no supplements in these trials, then your risk was 1.0. On the other hand, some people had a higher risk of dying. Some people had a lower risk of dying. And so, for example, in these two trials, they found out that the supplements had no effect whatsoever. But in this trial, the people had a higher risk of dying, higher risk of dying, higher risk. This one was a lower risk. These are higher risk. On the average, most of these drug trials show that taking these antioxidants as supplements actually increase your chance of mortality. Kind of counterintuitive. And it remains to be, it remains kind of uh, difficult biochemistry to understand what's going on here. So should you take antioxidants in your diet? And the answer is yes. In what form should you take them? And the answer is you should take them like this. <laughs> you should eat kind of whole foods. You should eat fruits and vegetables. As I showed you before, they are all just loaded with different kinds of kind of natural pesticides, many of which are antioxidants. And there the epidemiology shows that they're good for you. Okay. So how to explain this? I mean, what's going on? And probably an important part of the explanation is it's all about the dose. It depends on how much you have. So if we looked at cyanide, and this word here, hormetic, let's think of it as meaning kind of what's the effect. So these are things that don't have a, like a hormonal effect. These are things that do have sort of a hormonal effect or growth effect. If you take something like cyanide, and you can get cyanide in things like peach pits, et cetera, a lot of foods contain just tiny amounts of cyanide. At low levels, they have no effect whatsoever, but you hit some threshold and then they start to be toxic. And as you eat more and more of them, it's more and more likely that it'll have a toxic effect. But there are a number of other chemicals, including some of these antioxidants, where at low levels, they have no effect. And then you reach some threshold where they become beneficial. But in more is better for a little while, and then more becomes too much. You hit some threshold, and as you get higher and higher doses, the beneficial effect goes away, and they start to become toxic. All right, and so it's very difficult to calibrate this. That's why often people recommend against taking these kind of supplements unless your doctor is guiding you. And the best way to calibrate it is just to eat it in whole food, natural uh, fruits and vegetables, because they're present at low levels, but beneficial levels in those kinds of foods. Okay, so this is what you should eat. All right, I think this is a, a good point for me to, to uh, give people an opportunity to ask some questions if you want. So you can go into the, uh, raise your hand feature there. Anybody have questions at this point about antioxidants? Okay, so Mark, I'm going to, uh, you're unmuted, go ahead. Okay, well, this is very interesting. I remember I used to take uh, vitamin E mm -hmm. about 15 years ago, and then I read some longitudinal study. I think it was a review article, but it's it looked like Vitamin E increased people's mortality, so I stopped taking that supplement. And I was wondering, um, you know, that was many years ago. What other research that that graph you just showed with uh, was yeah. that a review article, or what's happened in the last fifteen years? Yeah, that particular one was from Scientific American. If I can remember, when I send out the slides, I'll send a reference to it. It's it's a uh, at this point that article is probably about six or seven years. I don't really know the answer, but the chemistry is very complicated. And I, I really doubt that they can really pinpoint an answer, but I know it's become consistently true that some of these fat-soluble vitamins in high doses uh, can be toxic. 
So not a very satisfying answer, but I think we don't have a satisfying answer yet. Okay, thank you. Okay, Virginia, uh, I'm gonna unmute you. Okay, okay. Virginia, go ahead. Uh, well, I just had, uh, you know, the annual tests and so forth, and I started taking vitamin D a while back, and uh, on the test I was just about, I was at the top mm -hmm. for vitamin D, mm -hmm. and I turned out I was taking twice as much as <laughs> the doctor had told me, mm -hmm. and I was reading it, and it said it would be toxic if you, you could actually take too much, but so, and I think it's made a difference. I stopped taking it. Okay. I mean, top, I'm back to what I was supposed to take. And I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, part of, is this is another, you know, complication in food and that uh, a lot of these supplements, uh, either A, they can be not what you think is in the bottle or B, they, they can be dangerous, actually. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I will go back to the slides then here. Okay. Wait, here, I unmuted myself. What oh. is the difference between hormetic and non-hormetic? Um, yeah, I, I was gonna look up at that. Uh, you know, I don't remember, and I'm gonna send you a copy of that article <laughs> which we'll describe it. it. It's kind of hormone related, but not exactly. Okay, yeah, that was you, Ann? Okay, yeah. I have a question too, I just wrote it. Um, when you say some of the supplements can be toxic, are you referring to hypervitaminosis or something else? Well, that term hypervitamin just means high, high vitamins. So, so, yeah. so it, it is like that, yes. You're just getting too much of something that uh, your body can't tolerate at uh, really high doses. Uh, any other questions? Yes, we have one. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the question I have for you is, I've recently heard of someone taking food grade hydrogen peroxide in very small concentrations. And um, it seems to defy my logic for why you would do this because you're introducing free radical oxygen, are you not? But um, swears by the medicinal effects a very low dosage, like six drops and some 20 mils of water with food grade hydrogen peroxide. And I would love to hear your opinion on such a thing. It's not me either. I am a complete skeptic about whether that could be good for you at any dose. You, you have enzymes that are specialized to get rid of every bit of peroxide as it appears. Uh, unless it's one of these uh, situations where it's diluted so that there's less than one molecule per dose, uh, <laughs> it's just a highly reactive, non-specific. Oh, I couldn't molecule. imagine it even getting out of your esophagus before it'd be like exactly. Consumed. It's just too reactive. You use it to bleach your hair, and it'll bleach anything that'll come in contact with means adding oxygen to it and changing its chemical composition. Well, my response to this person's opinion was, are you sure it's just not a placebo effect? Because yeah, yeah. I can't imagine it really surviving even the trip to your stomach. Yeah, I also don't know what the term food grade hydrogen peroxide would mean. <laughs> yeah. uh, I can only imagine in the slight lowest concentration possible is yeah. the only way I could interpret. Right. Okay. Any more? Thank you. All right. All right. Back to back to uh, going to change topics here. All right. Our favorite molecules: the fats, the <laughs> lipids. All right. So these come kind of in liquid forms. These are oils, and they come in solid forms. Like lard can be very solid, or some of them can be softer. Butter is mostly lipid, cream cheese is mostly lipid, etc. So let's look a little bit at the chemistry of what makes something a lipid, a fat. First of all, let me say that unlike uh, sugars and proteins, where there's a chemical formula 
that is called a sugar or a chemical formula that is called a protein. It's not true for the lipids in that there are different, very different chemical structures, all of which are called lipids. What is common to them is certain physical properties, mostly that they are essentially insoluble in water. They will not dissolve in water. They do not bind water molecules very well. Here's the most common form of lipid and fat. And I'm gonna make a chemical distinction in a minute between the word lipid and the word fat. Lipid is the more general category. All right, here's the most common form, and that is a fatty acid. It contains two regions. This is the fatty part. And what that means it, chemically is that there's no part of this structure that develops a small positive or negative charge. With the sugars, they had oxygen molecules in them. Oxygen has a high affinity for electrons. Electrons are negatively charged. Where you find oxygens, you tend to find more negative charge. All right, but that's not true here. The electrons are very evenly distributed. And the consequence of that is that water, which is a perfect example of where you find the oxygen, that's where you find the negative charge. Water doesn't really bind very well to this. It's not repelled by it, but it just doesn't stick to it very well. Now, there is a part on the end of the molecule here, though, that's got a couple of oxygens. All right, and this is where the acid part comes in because this H plus can come off of here and H plus is acid. And this can then develop a negative charge. So we call this a fatty acid because it has the fat part, the non-water binding part, and the acid part, the part that can be charged and can bind water molecules readily. Now the two big subcategories are saturated fats and unsaturated fats, and you've heard about this in your diet. So when something is saturated, it means it's full of something, and this one is full of hydrogens. Every possible place a hydrogen could bind, here it has bound. In an unsaturated fatty acid, what you see is like this carbon, instead of binding two hydrogens, only bound one. And the other bond is for a neighboring carbon, saying this carbon is only one hydrogen and it binds a neighboring carbon. So you end up with a double bond here and a couple of hydrogens missing. It is unsaturated, meaning it is not full of hydrogens. This has an important consequence for its physical property because it causes a bend in the molecule. And let me show it to you in a different way. So this is a, a space filling molecule where each atom, the oxygens and the, uh, the, rather the hydrogens and the carbons are represented by a sphere. And if so if a molecule is fully saturated, then it tends to form this very linear straight structure in the fatty part. This is the, the acid part up here, and these red ones are the oxygens. This one is different only in that it has a couple of more carbons in it, all right? But the overall structure is the same. However, if you put a double bond into the molecule, what you do is you cause this kink. And that has important consequences for the lives of cells and for our physiology. Uh, so before I move on to that, let's just think of the fact that if you put five of these together, you could see that they could all line up side by side in, in a tight, side by side in a tight cluster. But if you put five of these together, or you mix these and these, because of this kink, they just can't cluster together. They don't kind of stick to each other. These will bind to each other very weakly. They move around, but they're still slightly bound. But these, on the other hand, uh, 
can't pack as tightly because of these bends. And the consequence is that you find a lot of these in solid fats like butter or lard. You find a lot of these in liquid fats like olive oil or canola. Okay, we're gonna come back to that. Now, there's a third kind of structure that you can get. So here's your typical double bond in an unsaturated fatty acid. Uh, but often they will, they meaning the food processors, will try to introduce these double bonds into fully saturated molecules. Now, why would they do that? Because they want to take lipids that come in a solid form and convert them into an oil to make it easier to work with. And when they do that chemically, rather than using a naturally occurring unsaturated fatty acid, sometimes what happens is the hydrogens end up on the opposite side of the molecule. So here they're on the same side. Chemically, we say this is the cis configuration, same side. This is the trans across configuration. And that puts a kink in the molecule, but it's a very different kind of kink. It's just a kind of a straight line with a little zag in it, and then the straight line. These are very rare in natural products. Uh, and it's a type of fat that has been found to have uh, bad effects on your health. So among the older people in our audience, we grew up with a lot more trans fats. Originally things like uh, Crisco and shortening and some kinds of large and various kind of artificially uh, or chemically treated fats had a lot of trans fats in them. Now it was discovered at this point, oh, 20 plus years ago, that these are bad for, for you. And they've been almost completely eliminated from the American diet. Uh, but you'll still see uh, you know, things in health food ads to, that you should avoid trans fats. In fact, right now, fortunately, it's a good thing. It's very hard to find foods that have trans fats anymore. Okay, now let's switch to uh, this question of what's a lipid and what's a fat? To a chemist, a fat is a molecule made up of two or more of these fatty acids. So here is the very typical way you encounter fat in your food, especially if you're eating meat, uh, or you would encounter it also in your own body, and that is you take this three carbon molecule and you use it as sort of a scaffold such that to each of these carbons, you attach a fatty acid chain. One, two, three. And in our space filling model, it looks like this. So this is called tri, meaning three. Acyl, that's the linkage between the carbon and the fatty acids. It's an acyl linkage and glycerol, that's what the three carbon molecules here. So it basically means three acyl linked fatty acids to a glycerol. That's the definition of what a fat is biochemically. So if you have a high, high fat diet, you're eating a lot of this. Okay, so in our bodies, the Fat that we eat starts out as fatty acids, but we assemble them together in these forms of fat because they're very compact, basically water-free molecules that we can then put in very, very dense clusters. They stick to each other very well. And then we store them in these special cells called adipocytes. And if you have a multiple adipocyte cells, that's one cell, two cells, three, four, five, this is called adipose tissue. So our fatty tissue looks like this, and it is a very characteristic appearance in that it is very simple in its appearance with 
almost no other structures in it because these are really just little bags of fat, almost literally. <laughs> now, why do we need fat? Well, there are two, two reasons. One is uh, this, these adipocytes basically store, serve as an energy source. And we're gonna get to the question of how we get energy out of these fats. But the other is that they form one of the most important part of all of our cells. And that is what defines an inside of a cell and an outside of a cell is the boundary layer. And that this boundary layer is made out of lipids. We kind of have a, a, a lipid seal all around all of our cells. And in this cartoon, the way we uh, typically draw this in, in biochemistry books is here the little wormy-like things, those are the fatty acid, uh, individual fatty acids with their long straight tails, or some of them, if they're unsaturated, will have a crooked tail. And then on the, the sphere at the top is just a little cluster of small molecules attached to the fatty acid. So here is the typical form that you find fats in our, lipids rather, in our membranes. Pretty complex molecule. The core of it is you've got these three carbons here that form the primary scaffold. This is glycerol. And in the membrane, we find that two of the carbons have a fatty acid chain attached to it. But the third carbon doesn't have a fatty acid chain. Instead, it has some molecules that definitely have oxygens and are charge molecules. Okay, in this case, it's a phosphate. And then this is a, a little, I think this is choline here. I don't know if it has uh, regions that sometimes can be positively charged, sometimes chemically charged. The fact that there are plus and minus charges on this means that this can be surrounded by bound water molecules, They're kind of loosely bound, but this sticks to water very well. And that gives rise to the fact that this whole thing can spontaneously assemble into a membrane like this, where all the fatty tails will associate just with the fatty tails because they just bind water so poorly. And all of the heads with the plus and minus charges will be out here lined up, stuck to the water. Now, it's not that, that water repels them. It's just that water doesn't like the bind down there. So it excludes them and it allows for the spontaneous formation of membranes, the membranes that provide the protective barrier. All of our okay. Uh, whoops. All right. So what I'm going to show you next is a little uh, instructional video that I made for teaching biochemistry a few years back, addressing the question of, is this really true that we can form this rather complex structure just spontaneously without needing to assemble them? Well, in fact, you can demonstrate this in a kind of neat way in the laboratory. So here's my little, it's about a five minute long instructional video. Okay, I want to give you a demonstration of how lipids can spontaneously form bilayers in water. So what I have here is some water that has a little bit of ether in it. Now the thing about ether you have to be careful with is because it's highly flammable. And in fact, we're going to test whether in fact a little bit of ether dissolved in this water is indeed really flammable. Okay. I'm going to fill this petri dish right up to the very tippy top. All right. And if it's really flammable as advertised, we should get a little, whoa, all right. It is flammable. Okay. So we could put out this flame if we could form a lipid bilayer in the top of that water. So we need some lipid. Easy source, your ear. Just touch your ear slightly to there. Put it right on the surface of the water. What you get is a form of lipid that will form on the surface. It will rush across the surface of the liquid and put out the flame because there's now a very thin layer of lipid molecules on there. Now, maybe it was a trick. Maybe I put in some hardener or something. Let's give it a test here. 
it should not stay lit. It'll flash, but it won't stay lit because of the lipid layer. All right, now, if it's really a lipid layer there, I have to be able to get a glass rod and pull that lipid layer back, and that's what I'm gonna try and do. So I touch it right to the edge, and I pull the lipid layer back, right, get the matches there, and I'm gonna have Rusty go ahead and see if, in fact, go ahead and light that side and see if, in fact, the layer is pulled back. Whoa, okay, that really works. <laughs> All right, now, if there's a really a lipid layer there, I ought to be able to lift up the glass rod, it runs back across the surface of the plate, reforms, and puts out the fire. And so this is a really nice demonstration that in fact just a tiny amount of lipid will spontaneously form an impermeable layer in a water lipid interface. Okay, that, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, uh, I'll open it up for here questions <laughs> a little bit on lipid structure there. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, I, I think uh, these, Virginia and Tracy, I think this was from before, right? Okay. Uh, anybody have questions about the structure of lipids or any of that part of the talk? Mark, uh, go ahead. Okay, this may be premature, possibly you're gonna talk about it today, but I'm one of those dinosaurs who still eat breakfast cereals. And on the nutrition fact side, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, they usually talk about you know total fats, saturated fats, and trans fats. And some cereals have also polyunsaturated fats and monounsaturated fats. And I was wondering, are you going to talk about the polys and the monos today or is for another time? The, sh the short answer is if it's unsaturated, it has a double bond. If it has one double bond, it's monounsaturated. If it has two or three double bonds, it's polyunsaturated. So it's just, just, just unsaturated uh, fatty acids can come with one or more double bonds, and that's the, the, the mono versus poly. I think they're, they're both good for you. Uh, oh, so neither, neither of them is a, is a health issue then? No, they're they're uh, they're good they're good things. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, in the in the bottom line, to greatly oversimplify it, if you have these uh, unsaturated fatty acids, which are common in plants, they make the lipid more flowable. It, in other words, it doesn't form a, a kind of rigid solid structure, and that's a good thing, especially if you're moving them around in your blood vessels, and we're, we're going to come to that in a bit. Uh, Jenna, you had a question. Uh, I've got a, uh, yeah. Actually, it's me. Oh, um, Mark, yeah. I, I, I wanted to talk about um, the um, trans fats. I, I thought, I was under the impression that trans fats were produced by hydrogenation of unsaturated fats, and it was, it was intended to harden them. Um, rather than you know, hardened oils and things that they would. Uh... No, uh, that's correct, and I, you know, and I think I I, I said that incorrectly. I'm I'm glad you brought that up uh, because what you're saying is the right thing. You're right. They were starting with oils in an order to basically make margarine out of oil. You want to harden it, and so they add the hydrogen. Uh, to eliminate those double bonds, but in doing so, they would also they would in the process end up with creating these trans double bonds. Basically, they cleaned up the chemistry so that that doesn't occur. They do it in a way that produces almost no trans fats. Now. Okay. Thanks. Thanks Thank for you. the question. That clarification. Good. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're wondering why the uh, fat it's spelled. Oh, hold it! Uh, I, I'm lo I lost you. Uh, oh, okay. Just a second here. Okay, Melanie. I... Yeah, I'm back on again. Good. 
Okay, sorry. Um, we're wondering why the fat itself didn't uh, go on, uh, didn't become inflamed. And, and the answer is because it was basically in the water, you know, uh, it wasn't able to get hot enough or exposed just to oxygen enough to burn. The trick in that experiment is the ether because what's happening is the ether is coming out of the water, it's evaporating from the water and there's a layer of of gas, and that is combining with the oxygen in the air. The lipid, on the other hand, is literally immersed, combined to the water, so it just can't can't uh, can't catch fire. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mark, did you have another one? Yes, I did. Thank you. And real quick one. So the margarine we ate when we were kids was that mostly trans fats? It may have had some trans fats in it, yes. Uh, yep, 50 years ago, probably had a fair amount of trans fats in it, yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joanne, I'm going to unmute you. Okay. For some reason, when I try to unmute. There, I unmuted myself, is that okay? Yep, good. <laughs> okay, I have a question also, Barry, on the trans fat. So is it correct that the processors and the manufacturers were quite keen to use the trans fats because it added to the shelf life of their items? It could stay longer in the stores with, without uh, losing flavor and consistency. But of course, they did uh, contribute to cardiovascular diseases because they, they can... Um, add to blood clots because they do they do lay down plaque in the arteries is that that's still a, a, a valid uh, consideration of the trans fat story that's correct and you can see just looking at the structure that those fully saturated facts there's really no place for oxygen to bind but if you've got that double bond that's a site at which oxygen like an oxygen radical highly reactive can bind so if they eliminated those double bonds by adding hydrogens, they made them less susceptible to oxidation, which is what, when something gets rancid, that's what's mm -hmm. happened. It's add oxygen to those bonds, mm -hmm. but, but then can make things that are not good for your health. Uh, Thank you. Krista, you had a, you may have done. Okay, good. Go ahead. Hi, thank you, Barry. I love the demo. <laughs> Would it work with um, rubbing alcohol, like an isopropyl, or does it have to be ether? <laughs> Never tried it. I don't, you know, I don't think it would work very well because uh, the rubbing alcohol is so soluble in the water, okay. whereas the ether is just sparingly. The trick of it is not to get too much. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much. I, I eventually, I'm, Part of the reason I made the video is I thought I was afraid that the fire department was going to close down my class at some point. <laughs> Things went wrong, as you may know from teaching bio biology. Okay. Uh, Melanie, did you have your yeah. Yes. Um, I have a question regarding the mono and polyunsaturated fats mm -hmm. and what you were just saying about how they can easily get oxidized. Yes. Um, so what do you get then when you, because they'd they're be readily oxidized, wouldn't they be if they're exposed to oxygen? So they wouldn't last very long in their soluble form without um, being oxidized, either by heat or, or air or... Well, uh, again, I'm winging it a little bit here, but basically, uh... If they, if they do have these unsaturated bonds, they will go rancid eventually. And so lots of fatty things, if, they, if they're fairly high levels of unsaturated fats, simply become rancid. But that can take, you know, weeks. It, it's not a really fast reaction, uh, mostly because they're in a concentrated oil. They're not exposed to that much oxygen. But on the surface, et cetera, they are. And, 
and they, ultimately they will they will get rancid. Is are those bad for our body, just like the trans fats are? Um, um, uh, they're, 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 um, okay, here again, I, I don't want to speak with much authority, but they are, they are less desirable. Let's put it that way. I don't think they're particularly toxic, but basically rancid food can have all kinds of molecules that can form in there, and some of them at higher concentrations can be bad for you. Bottom line, don't eat rancid food. Yeah. I was just wondering whether it's safer to eat butter, which is already saturated, rather than, than um, polyunsaturated fats that... I, I wouldn't worry about it unless it was many months old. It, it'll last a long time. Uh, without being of concern. Yeah. Okay, see. all right, I'm gonna go back then uh, to our next section here. Let's talk about essential fatty acids. So you've probably heard about this. This is the whole fish oil story, etc. And this is also quite complex. So we talked about the, you know, in the very first lecture, there are certain about 50 things that we must have in our diet because we cannot synthesize them. A lot of the amino acids, vitamins, et cetera. But there are two kinds of fats that are essential. We cannot synthesize them in our diet and we must get them for our food. And these are called, often called uh, these omega fatty acids. The terminology here is you've got the beginning and the end of the fatty acid molecule, the alpha and omega, if you will. Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. So this end, opposite where the acid is, is called the omega end. And if you count back, this is carbon number one, two, three from the end, double bond. So an omega three, fatty acid is one that has a double bond at the third carbon from the end. And we need this in our diet. We can't make this. We can make all of this part, but we can't add this double bond at the far end of the molecule. For, for whatever reason, we've lost that enzyme. And this one is omega-6. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then there's a double bond. So. This is linoleic acid. We need this one in our diet also. Now, why do we need them? And what form do we need them? Okay. So let's take a look at what they look like. So here are the fatty acids that we've been looking at so far. The very simple ones is, is a saturated fatty acid. It's this linear shape. This is an unsaturated fatty acid, monounsaturated in this case, all right. But this is, uh, a, this one is a trans fatty acid, got this odd kink in it here. But we wanna focus on this class D here. This is linoleic acid. And it has two double bonds. The consequence of the double bond, two, two kinks, is that it forms almost like a hairpin structure. All right, and this hairpin structure allows it to interact with proteins and enzymes in our body, it has important physiological functions. So let's, let's look at that. All right, so here's, here's the complexity of this. So in order really to, to survive, we need to get some fatty acid that's got the double bond six from the end, and some fatty acids get got the double bonds three from the end. And you can get these from plant sources. So, and you need both of them. You need both of them. You, you'd like to have a, a reasonable, uh, not a big excess of one or the other, but a reasonable mix. Now, in general, this is easily come by because there are lots of foods that we eat okay, like soybeans, et cetera, lots of different kind of oils. Uh, 
will give us these two fatty acids. This one, the omega-6, is a little easier to come by than this one, the omega-3. Now, once we eat the plant and it goes into our body, our body has the enzyme to make it, to convert it into a more complicated fatty acid. So if you remember your Greek and icosa, pentanic fatty acid. This is something that has 20 carbons in it. This one, the doco, has 22 carbons in it. So these are very long chain fatty acids with multiple double bonds. And here's where the story gets complicated because we can in fact convert this to the final form that we need in our physiology, same over here, but it doesn't occur very efficiently in our body. And so often we are urged to eat oily fish, they say, because it does this, con we don't have to do this conversion of going from here to here, which can be a slow step in our bodies. Instead, we get this large molecule preformed in the food we ate, and it's readily converted to this form here. Uh, now, interestingly, uh, you need these final molecules here, these very complex fatty acids, for proper uh, development from the, from the fetus to, to a newborn child. And these are both found in breast milk. Uh, this is one of the reasons why doctors advocate for breastfeeding. Now, it's now known that this, these are needed, and so baby formulas often include them also. But it's kind of an interesting uh, kind of bit of information here that, in fact, one of the reasons, one of the advantages of feeding with breast milk is because it has these, these essential fatty acids in it. Where does the mother get them from? She gets them from the food she eats. So it's good for the mother to eat fish oil, et cetera. Uh, now, the reason these are important is they then go into some very complex pathways, which are uh, involved in a lot of physiology, but uh, one of the primary roles is they're involved in uh, inflammation. So inflammation can be a good thing. It can be a way we uh, fight off infections, it can be a bad thing, and, it, and then that can cause a kind of an overreaction on the part of your body. Pain is often connected with inflammation. And these are molecules that really regulate, signal the very complex mechanisms that control whether we want to induce inflammation in some tissues, get a lot of blood flowing there, or we want to slow down inflammation in some tissues stop our body from overreacting. Uh, it's, uh, there are a number of biochemical issues that vegetarians and vegans need to be particularly focused on, and this is one of them, because these intermediate molecules here, especially this one here, is largely available almost only from animal sources. Now, it's not 100% of people, if you uh, assay the presence of these compounds in people who are strict vegans or vegetarians, they often find that they are, they are at low levels and can be at suboptimal levels. They ultimately come, not from the fish itself, but from the algae that the fish eat. And so it is possible to buy and supplement your diet with the algae that makes this thing in the first place. So I'm not, I'm not gonna go into further on this because it gets us into medicine that's complicated and I don't want to uh, make any recommendations about what you should or shouldn't do regarding fish oil, but the, the basic consensus as far as diet is concerned that a little bit of shellfish uh, or regular fish in your diet is good for you because it makes these essential fatty acids. Okay, now 
Let me just uh, kind of briefly wrap up with a couple other points here. One is that besides making products like these pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory agents, most of the fat that we eat is used to make ATP. And the way that happens is that we have this long carbon chain with these hydrogens and carbons. And notice that there's no oxygens in here to compete for our electrons. And so fats are such high energy molecules because basically all the electrons, the electrons that combine the hydrogens and the carbons that combine the carbons and the carbons, all of these electrons can be taken off of this molecule, fed through that series of proton pumps in the mitochondria, generate a big gradient, and generate the synthesis of a lot of ATP. So a simple fatty acid like this will be chopped into two carbon pieces. It'll go into this whole metabolic diagram right at this point. We saw glucose went down to here, and then the part that goes into the mitochondria in the terms of fats is in these two carbon molecules. They go into this cycle that makes all that NADH, and that is ultimately used to make ATP. So a single one of these fatty acid chains can generate as many as 108 ATPs. That's why it's such a great energy source. There's no water in here. It, it's, uh, it's compact storage in all available electrons. Now, let's talk about another form of lipid, very important to our biology, and that is cholesterol. And you can see that this has a very different structure. There are no fatty acids involved in this. Instead, it has these four fused rings, very complicated structure, with this kind of a, a hydrocarbon tail. Uh, to synthesize this is a, is a long series of, I think, 26 different reactions in a row. You put the little two carbon units to make a little chain, and then you put multiple chains together to form the rings, and then you add the little decorations on the rings, and then you add the tail. It's uh, one of the most boring parts of a biochemistry course is the synthesis of cholesterol. All right. What it really looks like if you put all the atoms in as little spherical dot space filling diagram, cholesterol actually looks like this. So the actual molecular form looks a little bit more like the fatty acids than does this, this kind of formula. Now, where you need the cholesterol is that it forms about 15% of the lipid molecules in the membrane. So I showed how the lipids can spontaneously form into these membranes. Well, about 85% is, is fatty acid-like. The other 15% is cholesterol, and it keeps the right level of fluidity. We must have it. Cholesterol is essential. We make it in our liver. The problems come if we get too much of it. So, Let's look at how this is handled. So if we eat fatty foods, it goes into our intestine. There are molecules there that basically act like detergents. They're like, they're soaps. They're really soapy like molecules and they break up the fats uh, so that they can be surrounded by water molecules and kind of slosh around in here. And then there are special transport systems that carry them into the cell. This is a cell lining our intestine. Once they get inside, they're packaged for further transport, and that is these single molecules are put in big clusters called chylomicrons, and then they're put out of the cell, and they either go into our lymph system or into our blood system. Here are the structures that are carrying cholesterol and fats around in our blood. So here's this three fatty acid chains to glycerol, that's the fat. Here's a cholesterol molecule, this was a French <laughs> a slide here. 
here's just a cartoon of a protein. And so what you get is all of the fatty molecules that won't bind water, bind in a little lipid droplet here, a collection of cholesterol and fatty acid chains. And then sticking to that are proteins that are specialized to mark this collection of fat as a collection of fat that is to be taken to another part of the body, like the liver, for example, for processing. Now, if you think of the fact that if you pour oil into a pan of water, the oil will float because the oil and the fat has low density, fat floats. On the other hand, if you drop a piece of steak into the water, it'll sink. And that's because protein has a higher density than water. It's a high density. And so if you have a lot of fat in just a little protein in this transporter droplet, then you've got a low density lipoprotein, lipid part, protein part. So LDL, this is the bad one. This is the one you don't want to have at high levels. The LDL stands for low density lipoprotein. The low density means it's got a high ratio of fat to the carrier protein. HDL, this is the good one. You want to have higher levels of this one. It is high density because it's got a higher ratio of proteins to fat. And you can see that one of the chemical differences to this is this has got a lot more places that can bind water. It's gonna be more soluble. It's gonna move around in the blood easier than this one, which has got all of this kind of you know, fatty part and is more likely to cluster together. So why is this the good one? And why is this the bad one when you're talking about your serum cholesterol? Well, to greatly simplify matters, because it's really, it's really more complex than this cartoon, but, but the fundamental observation is that when your LDL L levels are high, you get a greater rate of these plaque formations, this cluster of lipid droplets and other molecules in your blood vesicles. Whereas if your HDL levels are high, that provides transporters that can basically solubilize your lipids and carry them in a soluble form in your blood vesicles. And of course, the concern here is that if these plaques get large enough, they can completely block the blood vessels and that's what causes, causes cardiovascular disease, the blockage of the blood vessels. All right, now to deal with this, we're gonna talk about one of the most widely used drugs in the world, really, and that is the statins. And uh, you know, when I do this class in person, at this point, I always ask the people to raise their hands if they're taking a statin. And most of the room, especially in the Oli group, are taking a statin. I'm taking a statin. I've been taking a statin for a long time. The reason they're so prescribed is because they are very effective in lowering the amount of blood cholesterol, and especially uh, the LDL, which is the, the bad form, uh, that, that'll bring down your LDL levels pretty effectively. Interesting to look at what's the biochemistry of this? Why does that work? Well, the cholesterol that is in our bodies comes partly from our diet, but it also, in very large part, comes from cholesterol, cholesterol that we make, largely in our liver. And when we make cholesterol, I talked about how it's a very complex pathway. One of the core structures that we use as a starting building block is this molecule right here. It's called HMG-CoA. All right. And this structure here, is kind of put together to form those four fused rings that are the core of a cholesterol molecule. 
What was found, and initially this was looking at the kind of natural products made in plants, were these complex molecules in which a part of this kind of plant insecticide, if you will, had a structure that looked just almost identical to this building block for, for cholesterol. Now, the way it makes cholesterol, of course, is there's an enzyme that binds this structure and connects it to other building blocks to form a cholesterol molecule. What happens with statins, this is one of many forms of statins, is that the enzyme, instead of binding the normal building block, binds this molecule here. And it comes on the enzyme, but it doesn't come off. So it effectively blocks the enzyme. It effectively blocks the synthesis of cholesterol and your cholesterol levels go down because you're just not making it at the same rate that you do in the absence of the drug. And they come in various flavors. And so some people find that they can tolerate some of these better than other of these. Uh, we know because this is such a major health problem, we understand the biochemistry of this in considerable detail. This is the enzyme that uses HMG to make cholesterol. This is where the HMG binds right here. And effectively statins act by binding tightly to this block, to this pocket, this active site, and preventing the enzyme from making further cholesterol. Um, so when these were first found, one of, the, one of the first treatments were for people who have this genetic disease, hypercholesterolemia. If you see something that's an emia, it means in the, in the blood. If you have leukemia, that's a, a blood cancer. Uh, if you have septicemia, it means you have sepsis, an infection in your blood. And if you have hypercholesterolemia, it means you have high cholesterol in the blood. So people, for example, have defects in the carriers or the effects in the synthesis pathways such that they make too much. And these can be really nasty diseases where you get people dying of heart attacks in their early 20s. So it was found that with these statin drugs, uh, if you looked at what would happen in untreated people, uh, when they, they would start with fairly young people and follow them over a period of 12 years, by the time you were 10 years into the study, 60% of these people with this, these severe forms would, be, would die. But if you put them on the statin drugs, only 5% would die. So it was really remarkably effective. And so there's a lot in the popular literature about whether statins are good for you or bad for you. The bulk of the medical evidence, as I read it, is that the benefits far outweigh the side effects. So I said, I take the statins myself. I just picked this data page from one medical study. There are, of course, hundreds, probably a thousand of these just to illustrate what some of the statistics look like. So in this study, for example, they were looking at uh, statins and whether they had effect on, this is a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and various kinds of cardiovascular ones. And they found out if they use this other drug here, uh, and you, the line shows here's the untreated, here's the risk of death, in this direction, the death rate is going up. You're gonna die early. In this direction, the death rate is going to go down. You're going to survive. And what they found in this group of PAC patients, for example, if they look heart attacks or death, if you put them on a statin, the group on the statin had like a 50% lower risk of death than did the control. And so, there's some people who are advocating that everybody should be on statins. Well, maybe that's going too far, but they 
really have been remarkably effective drugs, and it's good that we understand the, the basic biochemistry of how they work. So what we're gonna do next time is we're gonna turn to our, our last family of foods. We're gonna talk about proteins, and proteins contain amino groups, and there's some really interesting groups, uh, in, interesting chemistry having to do with those amino groups. So with that, I'm gonna open this up to questions. Uh, we'll go back here. Uh, so, uh, Krista, did you have a question? No, I think that was from before. I'm all set. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Joanne? Uh, yeah, yes, I have a question now on the cholesterol. Mm -hmm. If your liver is not overactively making an abundance and more cholesterol than you need, but is indeed from eating uh, from a diet that's high in saturated fats, butter, cream fresh, cheese, certain nuts, et cetera. Uh, can you reduce your cholesterol level by a very strict diet and exercise, you know, more exercise rather than statins? That would be an alternative if you don't have this problem of overproduction. What, what, what is seen there is it works for some people and it doesn't work for others. So it, it depends on why your cholesterol is high. It, for a lot of people, that in fact will work. There are so many different proteins involved in taking up the cholesterol and metabolizing it that variants, mutational variants, occur in all of us. And some of those variants uh, are resistant to treatment by diets. Other, others work very well by diets. So it, it's not an easy one to answer. Well, I tried a little experiment. My, my yeah. brother was able to get his down from about 300 to 200. Yeah. And uh, just by diet and, and exercise, I said, well, if my baby brother can do it, I can do it. And my doctor in Santa Cruz wasn't terribly keen, but she allowed me to experiment for five years. And I mean, I was very determined. I did get it from 279 to 200, and it hasn't gone back. But that's because I'm very strict with the diet and the exercise. So I'm sort of glad I tried out the experiment because I don't like taking what I yeah. perhaps don't need. So I was just testing it out. Now, I might be wrong, but so far it's better. Yeah, I think a lot of people have tried that experiment. It works for some, it doesn't work for others. Right, understood. Thanks. <laughs> OK, other questions? I have one. Yeah. Hi. Um, going back to the omega threes and omega sixes, um, for people who don't want to take fish oil as a supplement, or eat a lot of fish because they don't uh, want to do fish in their diet, mm -hmm. um, you can take flax oil. And I just yesterday was reading about it in a medical book. It's actually uh, as effective and cheaper than fish oil although it's been greatly advertised, so they try to make it look like the opposite, like the fish oil is more effective, but the science is, is behind flax as being very effective and not involving, and it's a plant-based nutrient, so it's not involving any meat. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to claim to be an expert. Uh, the flax, though, is giving you the, uh, the first product and so it does have to be converted in your body to those later products. And I think um, for some people, they just can't do that process very efficiently. So I'm, I'm not sure. I would, I would be slightly skeptical of whether it, it, it is as good as fish oil. Hmm. Okay. But I'm not a doctor. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Okay. All right. Well, I, I uh, thank you for your participation. And next week we will we will come to the the final lecture, uh, and we'll uh, focus on, as I said, on on protein and nitrogens. There's some interesting things that happen there, and kind of give a little a little grand summary at the end. Well, I will tell you exactly how to eat and how to behave. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I'll see everybody next week then. Okay.